but it's not going to clip onto the boxing glove. And that is how you end a game in style. Hey everybody, welcome back. I am David Bloom. I am the host of uh, Bloom and Tech Podcast, and I write people like Forbes. We're here at the E3 Esports Zone. I am with the pioneering esports god, uh, Kim Rahm, who is now with the uh, cool PC gamer tech site, Explain to Talk. He's going to explain about Explain. So Kim, let's start out. It's got to be interesting for you. You told me this is your 20th anniversary at E3. Do you remember those long ago days and what this place was like? Because this is, I think, here is where it was still going then. They had a couple of years in Atlanta. They said that was a bad idea. It came on back here. What was it like for you then and what's it like now? Well, I remember my first E3 was 1999, I believe. Um, and the f I remember the going to the airport in Copenhagen. And I was like dead set on having to get new shoes before I arrived. So I stopped Very at like, important. yeah, like at, at like a male dress thing, bought like nice suit shoes. And day one, I was ready to kill myself. Oh just my like, God, you got suits, like like dress shoes <laughs> for this place? I mean, you're like required to have your kicks, man, because you're not going to survive otherwise. Oh. I did six and a half miles of walking yesterday and dragged my butt back here just to be with you. And you've gotten smart. Well, show them what you're wearing now. Uh, over, the, over the time, you get this smarter, right? You get a little smarter. We, we hope we grow with wisdom, right? So uh, you got the bad, you had the wrong shoes the first day. It was gigantic then, it's gigantic now. Do you see anything different in terms of what kinds of games and things like that? The technology have changed so much, and you're the tech guy now. Actually, I would say no. Like, like I would say the technology has reached a point where you have to use a lot less imagination to understand what's going on, right? Things are explained a lot more clearly than they were 20 years ago where you had to, okay, that's a cowboy. <laughs> right, it's really <laughs> obvious what that thing is. Whatever it is, I can kind of guess what it is because it looks really good. But it was still the same technology race. There was still, you know, back then it would be great, uh, graphics cards, manufacturers, and so on. They are less important today, but now it would be consoles or virtual reality. There's still always like uh, a, a competition to present the entertainment in its best form. Right. Now, you, uh, back then and for years since then, have been very involved in the eSports world. So talk a little bit. I know you were involved with ESL, but a lot of other sort of major organizations over the last two decades in the eSports space. Tell me a little bit about um, where the eSports business has gone. I, it feels to me like it's a 20-year a overnight sensation. Well, mo most successes are, you know, 10 years overnight successes, right? Right. Um, I think in, in 2001, we were in Dallas uh, at a CPL event that was the biggest thing of its time. And there were 17,000 people that were watching this thing. And we all sat there like, we're making history. This is amazing. 17,000 feels like a preliminary match in, uh, yeah, I don't know, a new game that just popped out or something these days. Oh, ab absolutely. Like, um, like, but back then, it felt like you know, truly, truly special. And today, when you like, walk away with less than a million concurrent from an event, you're like, oh, oh God, what happened? Okay, you're <laughs> embarrassed, right? It's like, oh, you had a bad day. Uh, so now the numbers are huge. Does that change the game? Does it change the way the games get done? Does it change the kinds of games that get made? I, 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 so uh, on June 19th, 1999, Counter-Strike was released in the first version, beta 0 0.1. Another 20-year anniversary. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know what? For, for me, that was a defining moment in gaming culture, not just in esports. Esports was more or less born at that moment. Gaming became social. That was the first time where gamers would find each other online, almost like a dating service. They and could like, talk. We have this thing in common. Right. Let's meet and get fucking, uh, <clears throat> and we meet and get hammered. Get, get hammered, yes. That's, you were about to use the Danish term, I think, for getting hammered. Uh, Thor's hammer or something, yes. I think. And so, so uh, they were able to get together, able to connect, they were able to coordinate their raids and all that. But that allowed a whole bunch of different stuff and changed, as you say, the whole direction of gaming. Yeah, it, was, it, was, um, it wasn't just a new game. It was a new way of being a player. Right. And, and before we had consoles where you could play on the same screen, you had shared screens, but you weren't able to really connect with anybody anywhere else. No, like um, I was working in television at the time, and we had like a wall where we would play Nintendo 64 Goldeneye against each other. Right. right? But the, the social experience was limited to whoever was in the room. And whoever you were yelling at in the room, yes. right. Yes, updating in 8 FPS while you were like trying to like shoot someone in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's high quality there. Now, in the years since, uh, you've been involved in these different organizations. Are you still directly involved in any esports stuff? 
Yeah, absolutely, I've started my own, <laughs> as we all intend to do at the end of the day. Right. Um, no, I've been. Uh, I, I was uh, the guy who built a peripheral company called Steel Series. I ran marketing for eight years. Okay. Um, at one point in time, that that company probably sponsored 50% of the world's top teams. Wow. So I had a chance to get to know, you know, a lot of athletes and travel right. with them and right. see them at tournaments and get ready for tournaments and so on and. It's Once harder to do that now. There's so many more teams and oh, so no much one. more money chasing it. Nobody could do 50%. No, no one could do that anymore. And maybe that's also a good thing. You know, right, like. right. <laughs> Spread it out a little bit. I yes. mean, it, it's across the globe. Now, talk to me. Explain about, explain. First of all, spell explain so people can find it online because it's a little bit different spelling than the word explain. Uh, X-P-L-A-Y-N, explain. Okay. So, explain is a brand that I actually, I first launched it in 2001. It was one of the... It was probably the first profitable coverage website of esports in the world. Uh, that, as a journalist, I can tell you that's remarkable to have <laughs> somebody make money out of writing about anything. So. And in 2001, I went from running the, one of the biggest gaming websites in Denmark that I had built over a period of three years to starting this website. And my, all my colleagues in this were like, wait, wait, wait. You're making a website about one game? What's wrong with you? How That, that doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> a one game. Well, you might be able to do it now with Fortnite, maybe? Yeah. You've got 250 million followers. There's so much going on. They're always changing things. Maybe you could do it with them, but it's sort of hard to think about anybody else you could do that with, right? Well, but, well yes and no. Like I think the difference was back then, games were thought of like a thing you would buy it, you would play it for maybe three weeks, they would right. be done, you would beat right. the computer, right? You'd play it through, it's like on to the next, and, and they wouldn't give you new content either. Absolutely none. Like they didn't even have distribution methods to actually do that very well. <laughs> right, right, how would you even get it there, right? Yeah. Um, and then in 1999, Counter-Strike popped up. Um, I was running this gaming website, I started a Counter-Strike section. That Counter-Strike section in about a year grew bigger than everything else. Yes, than the biggest. So the tail started wagging the dog, and you said, okay, I'm going with the tail. Yes. And, uh, and is that site still out there? I mean, No, so, um, so that website, I closed it down. Uh, it closed down in 2014. It was the home of the Danish Counter-Strike community for a, a decade and a half. I closed it down in 2014. I did something else. And um, as I was working on this new project that I'm doing, I decided, you know what? That name means something in Denmark. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. But for the rest of the world, it's still a good name to explain the thing that I want to do. Right. Okay. So I decided so to revive it and, and go with it again. It, but not just for Counter Strike. But you, I mean, Counter Strike's out there too. There's lots of Counter Strike players. I think it's it's interesting because it is so old. It has an older uh, player base. I mean, I think on average the teams that play Counter Strike tend to be. I mean, other games they tend to be. Uh, out and uh, up and out by the time they're 23 and they can be like 30, 35 or something playing Counter-Strike. Yeah. I mean, it's a whole different world in some ways from the rest of uh, competitive gaming in some, in some ways. Yes. Now with Explain though, you all are doing things like gear. So what kinds of gear are, have you written about recently that, you, that really caught your eye, that you think are really, well, game changers uh, out so, there? So I think, I think what's game changing about peripherals is that is the nature of them has changed. So I hold maybe 10 patents in hardware design of coming up with a way of like combining uh, stats with how you do something on a mouse. Um, I, think, I think peripherals fundamentally have changed to become more like running shoes than they are these the high-tech nuclear power devices from Star Trek. That's probably a good thing in some ways. Um, I, I think so, but when you go buy a, you know, a pair of sneakers. They're I still pretty high tech, I mean. But I don't know, you know what the plastic treatment was of specifically the sole, right? And I don't need to know that for my mouse either. So we're taking a more practical approach to peripherals in general, okay. where we're sort of trying to reinvent the review. Like the process of like, how do I define if this was a meaningful experience to use this peripheral for me, and how do I share that with the community at large? Well, now that's interesting. So what we're talking about, instead of getting into the nitty gritty of, uh, I don't know, 14, 40 dot, dots per inch and all that, those stats, which start to make sense if you read and read and read and start to go, okay, so that's more than this and less than that, but it does. But you need to understand what that actually translates to an actual performance, right? So yes. that's the real challenge for a gamer. It's like, well, how does my game get better, right? Exactly. How, well, how, how does this correlate to me? What is my experience of this? Right. Like? And that's, that's very simple. Like, you know, you look at the statistics of the community, like, oh, everyone else who uses this mouse roughly uses it for nine months, then they want to change something else. 
Okay, that tells you something, right? That that's, a something. that's a data point. Right. So what we're basically trying to do is to make a better discovery of these peripherals that are available to you than anyone else out there. So like, you can get the same shopping experience as you would get on Amazon. We'll just hopefully do a much better job at presenting the five candidates that would fit well into your hand, into your size, into how you know, left-handed, right-handed, whatever right. it is. Right. So that's that's an interesting way to think about it. So, but that's also, I would think, a more of a challenge to write a good review because it's so personal to each person. When you can just rely on the stats, right? It's like, oh, it's like, oh, it, it is 1440 DPI or whatever. So, so some of the best reviews on the internet of games are on the Steam platform because they're capable of combining two different things. My experience, like my words, you know, what was my experience my own with the game? Subjective experience yes. as a critical player of games. Absolutely. With the time I've actually spent playing the game when I wrote the review. Okay. So we're trying to combine those two things. Like, you know, so an in, an in, a review of me doing a review of a mouse is interesting only if you know how long I've used the mouse, what I used it for, and what game I played with it. If you play a different game, maybe your experience would be completely different. Right. So that's the level of granularity we're going into on the Explain platform. So tell me how you all get access, because I do see the value of that, but how do you access uh, I mean, look, the, the whole notion of online reviews is under deep um, question in a lot of areas because, I, I mean, It's I mostly think, BS. Yes. Yeah, right, yeah, it's mostly BS. People question the whole Amazon faking their reviews. You've got uh, Rotten Tomatoes saying, if you can't prove you watched the movie, you don't get to review it, so you can't, like, jack with the, the reviews. You know, things like that are going on. So how do you guarantee that that data is good? Where do you get the data that says this person played nine months with this mouse. Where does that come from? From the gamer himself. So for, for a gamer to log on to the platform, he either has to have a Steam account or he has to have a Discord account. That already filters out most of the marketeers in the world. They're not smart enough to make a Discord account. <laughs> Second of all, okay. you know, we... <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> He, he, he means that, but he doesn't mean that, okay? Uh, marketers of the world, I mean that. we love you all very much. <laughs> so. Um, we actually just ask really, really simple questions. So when you sign up to the platform, like, how long have you been using the mouse you're using right now? We make it very simple for you to choose, oh, this month, this year. And then we tell you, okay, you've been using it for 36 months. That you know, it puts you here compared to the rest of the community. Already, you know, during the sign-up process, we're telling you stuff about the gear that you're using right. that you might not have actually thought about. And so, by so asking you're, you five you're, you're gathering demographic data on the front end as they come in. And by asking you five simple questions, I will know a lot about your peripherals. Like one. Do you think this mouse has made you a better gamer? That's okay. a really simple question to it answer. It really is, right. But it's really hard to think about. Like <laughs> well, if you're, if you're thinking hard about, uh, you know, what have I got here? You're right. It's like all of a sudden, oh, right, that kind of is literally the bottom line. Yeah. Right? And Does it this, make me a better gamer? Is this mouse comfortable to use after eight hours? Yes, no. Right. And then I know something about the comfort. What else are you doing with your life after eight hours? <laughs> but, but uh, yes. But, but that's interesting. So five questions. So, so does it make you a better gamer? Can you use it for eight hours and still feel okay without yep. your hand cramping up or any more than you would doing anything for eight hours? Does the amount allow you to play to your fullest potential? Right. So, so what are the other? Do you have any other questions? What are the other questions? There? Uh, we have a. We go into comfort. We go into satisfaction. Do you feel like you know the money you put into this is worth it? We do a, a real-time price check as you're signing up. Oh, the mouse that you say you're using, right now costs sixty-nine ninety-nine at right. Amazon. Is right. this fair to the community? Right. Yes. No. Well, that's an interesting question too, because like years and years and years ago, I worked, uh, I did some work with a, a website that was trying to get together, um, connecting people who liked wine, with wines that were good but would be good for their, but, but were good for their particular taste yes. pattern, right? And 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 but also the conversation was what we called a quality price ratio, a QPR, yes. because the idea was, you know, there's a fifteen dollar wine that's pretty good. It's not as good as the $90 wine, but I can get six bottles of that <laughs> for the 90 one that's maybe slightly better. Yes. So, I mean, it's the same thing. You're saying if I've got a, I don't know, a $30 headset that does just fine, as opposed to the $200 one, maybe this is really what maybe you should go Maybe that's great and get. for you. It's exactly. great, right. Yes. So, but it's putting it in perspective. If you've got the Rolls Royce, it damn well better be awesome, right? It, it, absolutely. So, so, that, so we're, that's part of it. We're making a, a hardware review site that's where we don't write the reviews, the audience does that. Right. And we're also not trying to sell you anything. In, in fact, we're almost trying to tell you what not to buy. Well, so how do you make money then? If you're not selling things, and you're almost the anti-sales machine here. How in are the, you making money? Uh, are you familiar with the website, The Wirecutter? 
I know the wire cutter, but it's attached to uh, the New York Times, which yes. helps. Uh, so. so they have, they have, you know, like modernized what the affiliate model could look like, where they you know, have one buy button that instantly signifies to you, oh, I get the buying experience from Amazon that I want. Right. But I also get a better product recommendation than whatever garbage I found on that platform. Okay, so by by not selling stuff, they're not allowing advertising, you're not as beholden to them, and they can say, if I like this review or this one, I can buy it, and you get, you scrape off a little bit, you yes. 10 percent or whatever, and that's enough to uh, pay for more camo pants and really fancy I hope E3 so. shoes. Yeah, you hope so. <laughs> I got you here from Denmark, or from Spain. I'm sorry. You're in wh where in Spain are you these days? Uh, I live in the Alicante region. Okay, that's lovely, and. Uh, and why did you end up there from Denmark? It's very different. I have lived in Taiwan. I have lived in America for a number of years. I've lived in Germany. I've lived in Poland. I travel wherever business finds me. Okay, and now Spain is the hot place? It's really hot. <laughs> it's really hot right now. <laughs> it, I say that in Palm Springs. Uh, two hours from here is 115 today. So, uh, I, I wanted to live in a place where the only stress I have in my body is my stress, <laughs> not everyone else's. Not everyone else's. Boy, bless you for that. I mean, good luck, too. So in terms of... Where you go, explain is keeping you entertained right now. How many, uh, how big is the site in terms of the uh, number of products and, and how many folks are involved in getting all that out the door? So we, we're just launching, we're in beta right now. Uh, we'll probably leave beta at the end of the year. We're about six people involved in the project right now. We have uh, every peripheral that's ever been used in esports. <laughs> really? <laughs> Within a, a mouse, keyboard, headsets, mousepad category. So we're about 1,500 products. Okay. Um, you know, my girlfriend and I, who built the website together, we spent almost two years gathering technical data for all these products and putting it into different databases. We cover, I think, 1,300 pro gamers, what gear they're using that we have like in the databases. And we are, over the next six months, adding all that together and presenting it to the audience. So when we say eSports, I mean, there are lots of mouses out there that aren't really built for the folks on stage right next to us who are showing a bunch of uh, indie eSports games, for instance. Uh, so you're really talking just about the high end. This is really the, the gamer equivalent of the uh, race car yes, reviews, right? Absolutely. It's like, here's the best shifter on your NASCAR or your Indy car or yeah. your Formula One. Or, 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 or here's the best one for $50. And here's right? the best one for $50. $50. Yes. Yes. But it still works, apparently, for folks in eSports. Absolutely. So that's an interesting, and, and obviously your background with eSports is so long and rich, uh, that makes sense, and you know so many people. Do you, uh, do you find people frequently say, we want that one, or we like that one? I mean, are you seeing some, some clear winners at this point that you could talk about? I, I think it's like phones. Um, I think we have a tendency to become brands Loyalists or some religious zealots, like to some certain degree. Right. So you're Hyper either, X, for instance. You're uh, either into Android or you're into iOS, right? Right. Well, yeah. You're that's, either that's into a Racer or you're into Logitech or you're into Steel Series. I feel like the, right. the brand sort of, sort of becomes like almost like jeans and clothes. Right. Right. Uh, you're right. I mean, they, they you like these jeans. You're going to keep getting those jeans because you know they fit. You like that mouse because you like the way they do it and they lay yes. things out. Um, but, but even there, though, are there? I mean, you're seeing, I guess. Uh, the different tribes, right, <laughs> for the various brands. Which are there tribes that are that are bigger, doing better? I mean, how are you oh, yeah, within, uh, within esports? On a global level, in esports, uh, Logitech and Razer are probably doing the best right now. Okay. And what we're gonna see over the next year is like uh, probably a bloodbath in retail. Um, as Logitech. Oh, I think that bloodbath in retail has been bloodbathing for a oh, while. Oh, yeah, I don't now. think it started yet for this specific segment. Oh, really? That's, okay. So it's you gonna think it's really gonna be tough. some. Really? Now, why do you say that? Why, why the next year and a half that, that, that the, the eSports video game... Logitech is not, is not doing super well as a big company, but they're doing really well in the PC gaming peripheral section. Okay. That has been the locomotive that drive a lot of the other things that they do. Razer has just IPO'd and wants to maintain a, a stock price at certain at certain level. So yeah, those two are going to do pressure it pressure to really, really And then you have go. Corsair, you have HyperX, you have all these companies coming in, and they want a piece of the pie too, and they're making great products. Right. There are right. so many people making great products for the price points 
to probably be sustainable for the industry long term. So uh, HyperX is one of the one of the uh, sponsors here. They've got a pretty entertaining. Uh, it's not the Game of Thrones. The throne. Game of Wasps. It's, it's not the Iron <laughs> Throne. It's the uh, it's the keyboard and mouse throne, yes. which is pretty entertaining, and I'm sure it'll it's get the, shown. It's the Mind Wasp machine. The mind. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So so people like them are pushing really hard in this space. But you're saying that we will probably see some shakeout in that space over the next couple yeah, of years. 20 Chinese companies that make roughly the same products that are waiting to enter the market. Interesting. So, so one of the things that I'll help do is to like sort those products out and help the audience make smart decisions. Right, now that, that's a really interesting challenge because you're right, you're going to see a lot of low cost, Challengers, we saw it in the the mobile space is sort of notorious. All of a sudden, you had a bunch of uh, phones that were dirt cheap, uh, were pretty good, and and the 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 incumbents had to had to fight back or couldn't. I mean, Sony isn't in the same place it used to be in terms of yes. electronics, for instance, because of the cheap Chinese and, and North Korean competitors who've gotten better and better and better. So, where do you think that that we'll see that most immediately? Is it going to be all across the whole? Esports gamer uh, peripheral universe. I, I think it's going to start in retail first, just because retail is under under scrutiny and pressure, as you already said, right? Right. So when the margin starts going down, it becomes even harder to sustain that. Right. Um, but we will see that materialize across the industry itself. Like we're long overdue for a correction in the market. You know, yeah. like yeah. And once once that happened, you know, then we are looking at an esports industry that is most mainly driven by marketing budgets. Okay, That's and who's one got the marketing budget, right? One of the first things that gets cut in a, in a crisis or in a recession right. is your marketing budget, of course. But that's the dumbest thing. I, I mean, I don't want to encourage more marketing, but I mean, the reality is if people don't hear about you, you're done, right? I mean, you got, if they can't, it doesn't matter how good it is. I mean, you can write a nice review and that'll help, but you got to find out about it too. So that's going to be an interesting uh, thing. What does that mean for all the esports players out there, whether they're pros or they're, they're coming up and trying to just play competitively? So we, we don't have a lot of historic data for this, but we have one. Like the recession in 2008, 2009. Right. Um, the industry was cut in half. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. wow. Back then, back then it, was also, it was a very different industry. Like companies like Valve and Riot didn't care. They, they weren't there with products in the market that they were supporting at the time. So when I say didn't care, like they didn't have a viable product that they could do something with, right? Right. Today, the publishers are very interested in getting their games played and, and, and spending that ecosystem. In 2008, 2009, most of the money in the space came from Microsoft. It came from uh, NVIDIA, it, uh, companies like that. Intel, um, I think, was putting some money in. Yes. And then you had like peripheral companies that made up maybe 40% of the whole space. Um, when they started pulling out their budgets, there was a lot of team that started folding. So if I just sort of look at like the price money you could win back then that could sustain you as a human being, right? the industry was cut in half. The livable wage, yeah. and so a lot of that marketing budget was going into the tournaments. So the issue is, can we keep it going for the health of esports as it's bubbling up? And I think that one of the things that's different, or I believe is different now, because we're seeing it, I just wrote a piece for Forbes about, and for TV Rev about uh, the explosion of like college esports arenas, uh, sites like a, uh, uh, Super League Gaming that make it possible to have your local restaurant or movie theater become an esports tournament yep. location. So we're, it's popping up in all kinds of places. But I'm, I'm sort of curious about, um, as it's blowing up, are there new kinds of advertisers beyond the endemics like? Yes the peripherals that are helping make it a healthier? Oh, absolutely, you know, like everything from like car insurance companies to Mercedes, right? Like, right, right. So the ecosystem is no longer like just nerds like me and my generation, now it's like everyone. And that's also I think the next evolution of what esports is. Like the reason why esports will do much better in whatever coming recession hits us is because it's no longer defined to a nerd culture, it's just culture. Right. 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 Like, right, like, um, well, I think that's the, my the point of, of all of Subnation is it's it's tied to gaming, but it's about just this culture of lifestyles of yeah. what people are into. Absolutely. Like, um, so my, my girlfriend has a son. He's nine years old. Him and his friends don't sit and discuss soccer. They discuss Fortnite or FIFA. Yeah, that's the only <laughs> thing that they care about. Like, right. Right. So you know, like, what we're what we're witnessing now is like a cultural disruption. Of, of sports as an e ecosystem. Right. Like, how many 17-year-old kids today do you think are going to go out and like, oh, I can't wait to become, you know, a U.S. soccer sports star? Or do you think they're going to be a Dota 2 star that, you know, where you can become a millionaire at age 17? Right. 
Sure. I'm pretty sure I know what they're going to set their sights on. There's a whole set of them are definitely going that way. Some of them like playing soccer. They like to kick the ball around. But you're right. I mean, the opportunity becomes uh, a whole nother, to be another, a whole other kind of star, and you can practice all day and all night long if you want to. Think about it this way. If you were born in 98 or later, you have never not known a world where esports wasn't normal. It's us old farts to remember the world that before that, right? I, I fully agree, except that I know lots of people that still can't get their head around esports. And I say, look, do you ever watch a football game or a basketball game? They go, yeah, sure, of course. I was like, well, what's the difference between you who've never played football or basketball watching a basketball game and people who played these video games watching other people play these video games and do well at them? In, in 2008, I had multiple friends who told me, I will never use a phone without a keyboard. <laughs> yeah, BlackBerry. I don't was see them anymore. I don't no, see them anymore. They're with BlackBerry and the ghost-ridden town of dead devices. There's no doubt yes. about it, right? No, I got. I mean, in, in Hollywood, in particular, where I do a lot of writing, I mean, agents used to have their BlackBerry surgically grafted to their <laughs> hand, and they would da 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 with one hand, and they could da 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 and send out you know a thousand uh, text messages to their assistant and all their clients and the 15 deals they were trying to cut that day. And now they're all on something else, yes. right? Um, exactly. And rolling 200 calls that way. So, so where do you think? the peripheral world can go. So we've got this very established ecosystem of as you know, keyboard, mouse, mouse pad, the things that you review. But we've got things like VR games coming, and we've got partly here, really, but and, and AR games that are really interesting and some of the things that they're possible as we get more and more power. We've got 5G coming down the pike. We've got over here uh, the cable industry um, talking about 10G, their uh, landline-based, uh, even higher 10 gigabit speed uh, stuff. We've got um, uh, even the broadcasters trying to figure out ways to do better connectivity and interactivity. So where where do the peripherals go, and what do you think is cool that's going to be coming down the pike that might change the future of esports? So, I, I think we're pretty much set for innovation in the industry, which sounds scary, but like, um, I would equate it to the tennis catcher. I, okay. I, 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 without knowing, my guess is that fundamentally the tennis catcher hasn't like, you know, fundamentally changed in the last 10, 20 years. Right. Um, same thing with the badminton catcher or the whatever ball thingy that they're hitting. You know, so you need the racket itself. Yeah, but yes. the rackets did change a lot in tennis. I know they went crazy and they they strung them up with the nylon and as opposed to wood. And now Absolutely. they're like these rocket devices. But the fundamental, the fundamental, like what it is, right? There, there might be lightweight materials, but they're not going to be anti-gravity all of a sudden, you know, like, well, or not made yet. of like a or something, right? Not yeah, so, we're doing VR tennis soon, and, yeah. and I'll so, look forward to that. So, so fundamentally, like, I think the tool sets that allow you to perform with high levels of precision are more or less done. What will change will be the games that we play. It won't be, like, necessarily the peripherals. I right. think there's still some, some stuff to do for integration. When I press WASD, how hard I play, how, how hard I press them should determine how fast I move in the game. That level of like sort of integration still has some room for innovation, but more or less, I think the peripherals are actually done. Okay, they're 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 there, and it's just going to be working around the edges. Well, that's probably a good place to stop. I'm David Bloom with Kim Rom, and you've just been hearing about Explain and explaining about where the world of peripherals and esports are going. Thank you very much. Thank you.